Honestly, I've had a weird <coughs> last few days. Yesterday, I, I was blessed to be a part of a worship service that was, I felt like was a very spiritual and a very moving time together with other believers. Uh, the night, a couple of nights before that, I was a part of a service that was I didn't feel like was that. Um, we were referred to one time as being on the Titanic. And uh, I don't know if we're going to hit an iceberg or not. But things have changed dramatically during the years I've been pastor here. And how dramatically they've changed, I did not know until recently. It's become very apparent to me that things have changed a lot. And so, therefore, uh, it's been a kind of a weird weekend for me or last few days for me. Now, we're in the 95th Psalm. I know I kind of threw that out there and left it hanging. This morning, as I normally do on Sunday mornings, I printed out my notes on what I was going to preach on today. And I have no idea where they are. No, I got them out of the printer. I don't know where they are. Now, I'm reminded of what a preacher said years ago about his notes. When somebody said, you don't need those notes, you can preach just as well. He said, well, I don't have the notes for me. I have them for you. Do any of you understand that? Well, let me explain it to you. Without notes, we're liable to cover the last hundred years of church history. Because I'll have nothing to keep me focused. Yeah, yeah. Look for a way of escape. We're talking about being in the audience, or on stage rather, and God is in the audience. That it is God who is listening, it is God who is paying attention, it is God whom the Bible says seeks those who worship Him to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Some years ago, a professor of of mine at Union University said this, and I, I think it's just well said. I want to repeat it today. He said when he was driving through a community, he said on the church sign, it had this phrase, worship, 11 o'clock Sunday, come worship with us. And he said that's a very common message. And he said, but can they do that? Do you understand what he's saying? Oh yes, they can come in. Oh yes. The doors here are open to people who want to come. But the question is not that. The question is, can you worship with us? And then there's a more profound question in that, and that is just because we have a worship service, does that mean we will worship? Did we get enough sleep last night? Are our minds clear? Are they, are they complicated by work or by relationships or difficulties? Okay, so we're just going to give you five minutes. You tell me what your problems are. Okay, thank you. I look at your faces. I know you got problems. And I know what some of them are. And I can even name some of your problems by name. But I can tell you, right, but I can tell you that the hardest thing you will ever do is worship. Because... 
You can't set aside the world long enough to focus on God. And that is in itself the devil's trap. You're thinking about work or the lack thereof. You're thinking about somebody who's creating a lot of trouble in your life. You're thinking about what your kids and how they're doing in school. You're thinking about your relationship with someone. You're thinking, thinking, thinking. Thinking about if you're going to have enough money. You're thinking about if you're going to have enough of this and enough of that. Years ago when I was in a, in a group in college called Southern Singers, which by the way, I renamed this group the Sweet Inspirations after Elvis. I think so. I think this is it, the Sweet Inspirations. They're out of business anyway. Let's call them this. Let's call them that. But when I, when I was in college, I was part of a group called Southern Singers, and we had a we had a skit that we used to do, and I, I kind of want to do that skit this morning. And so my job, I had a, they gave me a real easy job. They knew I couldn't act or even pretend to act, and they understood my skill level immediately. You remember that group is the one that said we can use your guitar? Yeah. And I thought, can I play? <laughs> will, they, will you let me play? I thought they meant they could just use my guitar. Well, anyway... So I was in this group, we, we, we traveled Missouri, we traveled Arkansas, we uh, sang <laughs> at the Arkansas Baptist Convention in Little Rock. Of course, by the way, there was about 150 of us, so well, I, I was standing in front. Hey, something you may not know, if you were ever on stage in a, in a theater, do you know those lights are so bright? that not only are you sweating, but you have no idea whether there are people out there or not. You can't right. see them. That's, right. That's why Carol Burnett said, could you break down the lights or break right. out the lights or whatever. So anyway, I'm in this group. And this the way the skit goes is I would stand up in front of the people and I would raise my hand and I would say, and I say, and I would stand there like that, and then somebody off the stage would then say, Gosh, I'm really, really hungry. I don't know where we're going to eat today. I hope we eat something good. Somebody else would go, man, I can't believe he wore that today. Uh, I can't believe they wore the same thing they wore last week. That's not appropriate. Then somebody else would say, wonder what time the football game comes on. They do play today at 12. This was back in the day, remember when we had VCRs? Right. Or nothing, right? So that's the way the skit goes. And then they stop talking, and I go, and thank you for listening today. God bless you. And then I stood at the back. This group would come through, and they would say, that was a great sermon. Thank you, Pastor. You get that. Zig Ziglar used to say that you have about six minutes. That's all you have. Unless you can tell a funny story. That was his style of speaking. That was what he taught people. He said that after six minutes, you've got to tell a funny story to wake them up and bring them back. But folks, listen, this is not about me. That's right. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I'm too old for that. Yawning and sleeping and looking at your watch. It's not going to bother me. The question is, does it bother God? Answer that yourself. Be stewards of your sleep the night before. Be stewards of your attentiveness on the day of the Lord. Be good stewards. And therefore, crowd the noise out. Let God have you for just a minute. Not Stan Griffin. I'm not worth a minute. But let God have you.
you for a minute. Now, how do I know all this? Because I was you for many, many years. I am you. I had to listen to Rock. Rock's good. Anybody named Rock's bound to be good. So I listened to Rock. Except not the Rock. Not Dwayne. But I listened to Rock Collins, and he was good. He did a great job. So I listened to him. But I noticed if I wasn't careful, my mind was meandering around. I'm going to drive an hour to get home. I what time we're going to get yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And so when I was in college, then later in seminary, I can recall men smarter than me standing up and talking about it, and they called it being stewards of your mind. So that you are in a place when you gather to worship, you can do it. Because if not, you will not do it. Why do people walk out? Did you know, did you know, and, and I, I've heard people spiritualize this, and I'm not going to discredit this, but do you know that I have preached on things and had people at the end come up to me and go, man, I really love that sermon about sin. I didn't preach on sin. Now, again, you can spiritualize that and say, well, that's a work of God. That's nice. It could also be a work of sleeping during the preaching. And at the end, I said, you need to turn from your sin, and they thought that's what the sermon was on. So here we are. Don't do it for me. Don't do it for me. Do it for Him. Amen. Don't do it for me. Do it for Him. You can't change my life. I'm already lost my hair. Do it for Him. You, you're not going to pay me more if I'm better. You're not going to pay me less if I'm worse. I love you, but don't do it for me. Do it for Him. Which, by the way, let me just say this. If it's baby's cry, baby's distraction, that's a blessing from the Lord. We're good to go on that. I'm just talking about us as adults. All right, 95th Psalm. The Psalm written by David, led by the Spirit of God to write David. David could not have known these things about God without the Spirit leading him. Not only did the Spirit come upon David for the time he was king, but it also was upon him for the time that he wrote these psalms. And we want to, we want to flesh out this 95th psalm. We are, we are on the stage. God's in the audience. Have you ever tried to pray and you couldn't stay awake? That's not all bad. It's not all bad to fall asleep praying. It's probably bad, though, if you're, the prayer lasted 30 seconds and you fell asleep. But it's not bad to fall asleep praying. Uh, there are worse ways. David said, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. I heard you singing today. Good for you. That's right. Amen. Good for you. Good for you. I talked to a friend of mine. We use our phones here, both I and Android, and we use our tablets, and we use all of the devices, just like all churches do today. We don't have a big screen back here in the sense of using it for the sermon. But, you know what? Some preachers tell me their folks are texting each other during the preaching. A little shaky. A little sketchy. A little sketchy. A little sketchy. No, you're not. You shall stand before the Lord and give an account. No, you're not. You've been warned by Brother Stan. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. You were singing this morning. The psalms are to be sung 
David is speaking of singing. He is being led by the Spirit of the Lord. Look at the 96th Psalm. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Just be careful with it. And here's what I'm saying on this, right? I mean, there's a lot of new stuff that's been written that some of it might pass the sniff test. And there's some of it that is all about man. Let, let, me, just, let me just digress just a second when I talk about singing. We will sing any song that's well written and that has, has a deep enough theological content. But we will not, we intend not to, though we have, to sing songs that, if you didn't know any better, are not really about Jesus, but sound more like the love a boyfriend and a girlfriend have for each other. There is something to be said about it is well with my soul. If I thought it was just an old man talking, I wouldn't do it. But I believe there's something about the power, there's power in the blood. I believe there is something about the old rugged cross. I believe there is something about those songs that transcend songs with the word dance in them and all that stuff. That's all I'm saying. I believe that. What can wash away my sins? When I boogie. When I boogie. That's where we're at today. It, isn't it funny though in our lifetime? Our lifetime, right? That we went from you can't go to that's what it is now. You get my point. We went from you, you can't go. Like mama had to drop us off a block away from the high school dance and let us sneak in. <laughs> to today, if you don't dance in the church, something's unspiritual about you. Now I'm just saying, he says, oh come, let us sing. To the Lord. I heard you singing today. Thank you for singing today. I don't have to tell you that. That's really not my job to do that. I'm not a cheerleader. But something happens when the people of God come together to sing and praise the Lord and to worship God. I'm not against a little movement. You know, sometimes folks are dead. We need to move a little bit, let people were still breathe. But I'm just saying that if you can whoop and holler all you want to and walk away as lost as you can be, you can whoop and holler all you want to and not walk away with one thing that makes one difference in your life because that's built on emotion. And emotion alone does not change us. Amen. What happens to you when you're in a church service that's solely built on emotion, and by the way, I know somebody take exception with that, but is built primarily on emotion. When you walk away, you can't remember, remember what manner of man or woman you are, and whatever happened in there is not long-lasting. It's not. Have you ever just felt good after a worship service and asked yourself the question, so what? So what? Because if you know anything about feelings, you know you can feel good in a church service, get on the highway and feel bad in just a few seconds. Feelings... Is not what we're after. Amen. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. That's God, right? The rock of our salvation. It doesn't mean dead. It doesn't mean inanimate. It means that He is dependable, solid, weighty, trustworthy. I've got a... Uh, I've, I've, 
uncovered some big rocks on my farm. I'm sure there are a lot more, but I've uncovered some big ones. I brought a rock up to my house, next to my house, that is at least this long. And Carl Sagan told me millions of years ago. Yeah. At least it's big. And then I found another big rock, and I just moved it as far as I could, and I didn't have anything that could move it any farther, and that's where it is. But you know, when I go down there, it's still there. Right? Because unless something's purring down there, nothing's going to move that rock. That's what it's talking about here. The unmovable steadfastness of God. Amen. We worship Him recognizing that. We are not presumptuous about that. Do you understand what the difference between... between mm -hmm. Do you understand the difference between presumptuous aboutness about God and true worship? And that is believing God is always there and taking that for granted. I don't take it for granted he's there. Nor should we. The psalmist says, Oh, come. Do you like an invitation to come? Some years ago, someone told me that they would invite me to the club meeting, but since I wasn't in the club, they couldn't invite me. So I don't know how you get in the club. <laughs> I didn't want to be a member of a club anyway. Well, invitation, come. It's a New Testament invitation. An Old Testament invitation. I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. New Testament invitation is forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of most of the West over is. Come. To come to assemble. Come to assemble. Something happens in the church that doesn't happen at home. When, uh, whenever we had this storm, uh, we uh, went out to uncover some folks. And I don't mean they died or anything. I mean just to uncover some folks. We had some conversations. As some of you know, I, I, uh, I walk the streets some. You may have not seen me. If you didn't see me, that's all right. I still walk them. I had dogs chasing me down west over. As usual. Oh, he's all right. He won't bite you. Don't let them teeth bother you. I'm not big on mean dogs, right? Or mean bats. But having said that, going knocking on doors, talking, oh, no, no, we, we're good. We're good. No, no, we are. Right. Where, where are y'all Where y'all assembling? You say you're a Christian. We're, well, we don't do that. We don't do that. Or we do it online. He says, come, the assembly, there's something, two or three gathered together in my name. God is in the midst of them. There's something going on. Something happening that can't happen anywhere else. COVID, COVID was one of two possibilities in my mind from this perspective. COVID was either a process whereby God exponentially brought about the apostasy that he speaks of in Scripture and or a, just a work of Satan. But it changed the church. I go to the meetings on Monday. You look around here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 12, 14, 17, 19, 23, 25. Is there anybody down the hallway? Just kidding. 25. <laughs> Do you know that there's probably 10 pastors there that would give their eye teeth to have 25? I talked to a guy at a meeting. 
You would know him if I called him by name. He said four years ago we had 80. We're running about 20. I will go tomorrow in the morning to meet in a building in Jackson that is one of the finest facilities in this area. I mean gymnasium. I mean when I came to Jackson, four or five hundred people gathered there on Sunday mornings. They had twelve. I can take you up and down these roads and let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I told somebody the other day when they told me they went to church and they named the church, I said, oh, you don't go to Inglewood? I thought everybody went to Inglewood. You know, people are not, this is the big lie now. Everybody goes to Inglewood, but Inglewood will tell you not everybody's coming to Inglewood. But everybody tells you that we go to West Jackson, we go to Inglewood. No, they don't. They're just telling you that to get you off their back. And I don't mean this lightly, but COVID is over. I'm not saying people are not getting cold. Of course they are. I'm not, I'm not out of touch. But I'm just saying, that excuse is over. People are not assembling anymore because of their relationship with God is not right. That's what's wrong. I take seriously when he says come together. This invitation to come, I love it. Come, come. I appreciate it. Thank you. What if somebody came to you and said, well, I would invite you to church, but since you're not a member, we can't invite you. <laughs> oh, come. Amen. Come, we'll let the Methodists come here. Amen. Come. This invitation is to whomsoever will come. Sure. Why? Why? Not because we have a good preacher. Why? Not because the walls look good, though they do, and the molding looks good, right? Not because of that, but because God is good, and God Amen. is worthy, and God deserves all honor and praise and glory in the world, but especially in His house. Amen. Oh, praise His name. Come, let us sing. Come, let us say. I love being up here with my brother and the rest of the this inspiration. Sweet. Sweet. I left the sweet inspiration. Oh, come into his presence with sin. And he tells you why. Why? For the Lord, He's a great God, verse 3, and a great King above all gods, yes. including your own little God. Yes, we, like to, we like to attack the Catholics, us Baptists and others. We, you know, they got these little statues on there, which is nothing like that little bobblehead dog that people need to have. But they got these little statues, you know. Well, at least they know what it is. We all got our own little statues. Just called idolatry. What's wrong with people is they become their own God. And they don't need God anymore. Because they already have one. It's them. You don't think God would ever ask you to do anything you're uncomfortable with? Yeah. You don't think God would ever ask you to do anything that's sacrificial? You don't think God would ever ask you to do anything that would bother you? Oh, yes, He will. You don't think God would ever want you to step out of your comfort zone? Oh, yes, He does. Yes, He does. For the Lord, He's a great God. His hand are... Are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are His also. The sea is His, for He made it, and His hands formed the dry land. And what He's saying to you is get off of His earth if you're not going to worship Him. He 
see that? I kind of get that. Years ago, me and the, the girls uh, were going to go camping. Remember that, girls? And uh, we were going to go camping. Now, they didn't know I was going to sneak away once they got to sleep. Anybody that camps with me knows when the new day comes, I won't be anywhere in sight. I'll be at the house. No, I wasn't going to do that to them. I was already planning on staying the night. So, so we were going down there, and there was uh, three of us, four including me, and we were going to go down there. And uh, uh, the farm that I'm blessed to be a part of is large enough that it's very, very unusual for anybody to be on it other than me and a few family members. You follow me? So when I see somebody, that gets my attention, right? So, so anyway, we're headed down this uh, dirt road, basically, that winds down into what we call the bottom, and down there is a pond. And I get down there, and I haven't been down there in a couple of weeks, and I see a red pickup. A red pickup. That gets my attention. Not because it's red, but because that pickup is right next to the pond I have down there. And I'm not going to go into all the details of, of my firearms and all those questions that I threw at this person. He said, no, oh, no. He said, I'm not. He said, I'm all right. He said, don't, I'm no threat to you. And of course, all that time I was thinking, right, I've got a shotgun that tells me you're no threat to me. But that's what I was thinking. I kept my distance. Come to find out later, he had been living there for several weeks. I didn't even know it. And here's what went by through my head in addition to some other things, and I'm not going to get into all the details of that story. There's a lot to it, right? What went through my head is, unless you pay the taxes, you can't live here. Amen. That's what went through my head. Now, the police said, you have a problem with him being down here? I wanted to say, well, no, I just called y'all to make you aware of it. <laughs> and they were very nice. They did a very good job. It turned out that this gentleman had some dementia kind of problems. So, you know, he was no, he was no threat. His family was glad to hear that he was okay because they had missed him. But that's what went through my head. Now, what is he saying in the song here? He made this. He made this. He made the mountains. He made the sea. He made the dragon. In verse 6, Oh, come, let us worship, bow down, let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. That is not come as you are. That's come as He says you are. Yes. See that? See, this is what the professor was saying to us. He was saying, you can come, but you may not be able to worship. Did you worship today, sister? Did you worship today, sister? Did you worship my bearded friend? How would I know if you did? How would I know? Oh, yeah, you sat up here and sang. Oh, you played the keyboard. You ran the words that you'll be worried about whether the timing was right later. <laughs> you looked awake. I mean, you looked like you were about yourself. Most of us looked like we were intelligent. When I say, did you worship today? That is a profound question. <laughs> we used to laugh. We had a saying in our family. And when we ran in, this, well, I can't tell all the sayings we had. But one of the sayings was, lights on, nobody home. What I always do as a man 
is when I'm listening to a sermon, when I'm about to lose it, I go. That's kind of a reminder to me, you need to get back on cut, back on planet Earth. You know, you know, drift it off. Remember my skip? doesn't say come if you'd like. The psalmist doesn't say come if you if you think about it. The psalmist doesn't say come if you're having a nice day. The psalmist doesn't say that. David says come. He is worthy. Bow down before him. Kneel before him. He is our God. Amen. And we are what? The sheep of his past. His past. See that? His past. I don't know what your translation says. If it doesn't say his past, you throw it, throw it out your window on the way home. We are the sheep of his pasture, which means when you see a pasture with sheep in it, you're thinking this. That shepherd better be a good guy because if not, them sheep are going to starve to death. That shepherd better be a protector because if not, when the sun goes down, those sheep are going to be slaughtered. That shepherd better be good or those sheep are going to have a rough time of it. And David says, it's going to be alright. Because we're his sheep. We're his sheep. Well, I just want to close at the latter part of this. Where God says, not only come as I say you are. By the way, I say you're to come. But also to realize there's some that ain't coming. Because he says in the latter part, therefore I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. That generation that rebelled against me, they wandered in the wilderness. They didn't follow me. Reap consequences of it. Well, I hope you heard me say today that He is worthy. Be good stewards of your worship. Don't phone it in. Now, tomorrow morning, I have to be in Jackson at 10 o'clock. Now, that may not sound like a big deal to you because some of you have to be here earlier. And some of you do drive like I do, and it's my choice to drive as far as I drove, and I'm not complaining about it, but it will take me about an hour and a half to get to where I need to be at 10 o'clock. I don't enjoy that. You don't pay me to do that. And I'll have to muster everything I can to do it. And the bottom line will come this way to me. He is worthy of me doing that. Amen. Because there won't be anything in me that wants to. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. We fall short. We're miserable sometimes. We, we lack a desire to do things joyfully. We sometimes just phone it in. Forgive us, God. Let us worship you in spirit and in truth. Let us come the way you tell us to come. Let us not be presumptuous and just say, oh, well, you're always there. I can come whenever I want to. Let us not do that. That is idolatry. Father, bless this invitation for your glory. Bring us to Yourself in Jesus' name. Amen.